Amen? Amen? All right. So with that being said, let's get started. All right. Psalm 92, verses 12 and 13. Psalm 92, verses 12 and 13. It says, The righteous thrive like a palm tree, and they grow like the cedar of Lebanon. Verse 13, Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courts of our God. Amen? Now, two times we see the word thrive in these two verses. And we looked at the definition of thrive. Thrive means, the, uh, just uh, Google it or open up a dictionary and you will find these definitions. To grow vigorously. In other words, to flourish. All right? To grow vigorously or flourish. The second definition that we see is to gain in wealth or possessions. To gain in wealth or possessions. In other words, to prosper. And the third definition, to progress towards a realized goal because of or in spite of the circumstances, all right? And that's the definition where we are really focusing on uh, for this series of sermons, all right? To progress towards a desired goal in spite of circumstances, all right? Now, a, a lot of times uh, when, when, when we are moving towards a target and when we get to a target, we say, well, everything worked out well and we were able to achieve the result. Or we will say, well, Things did not work out because of the circumstances. We were not able to get to the goal that we wanted to get to. Now, what I want us to understand is this. As children of God, as people that are called the righteousness of God. How many righteous people do I have here? All right. So, again, because I see some new faces, righteous people are not righteous because of the act of their actions. Amen? We call ourselves righteous because God calls us righteous. We don't call ourselves righteous because of our, our good works or because of our own merit. We call ourselves righteous because God calls us righteous, because he made us righteous. The Bible says that he who knew no sin was made to be sin. Talking about Jesus Christ. He knew no sin, he did not commit any sin, but he was made sin. So that you and I can be made the righteousness of God. Amen. And so none of us are made righteous by our own strength and effort, but we are now made the righteousness of God because of God's goodness in our life. Now, so here it says the righteous thrive. That means if you call yourself righteous, that means every single one of us, we're supposed to thrive. And we're supposed to thrive not just when the circumstances are, are, are pleasant, not just when everything is going right, but we are supposed to thrive in spite of the circumstances. That means you're supposed to thrive in spite of your lack of education. You're supposed to thrive in spite of the caste, in spite of your skin color, in spite of the country that you were born in, in spite of uh, 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 the lack of money in your family, whatever excuse you come up with. See, the, I, I said this morning, Jesus and excuses cannot coexist in your life. You either have Jesus or you have excuses. You cannot have Jesus and excuses in the same place, right? And so if we are supposed to thrive, then we need to start walking by faith because in the kingdom of God, everything operates by faith, amen? And so we, we, we learned a lot of things uh, over the last couple of uh, uh, sessions and today let's turn to first Timothy chapter 1 first Timothy chapter 1 and even as you're turning there you see w one of the things that stops people from truly experiencing the blessing of God in their life or truly experiencing God's promises in their life is I said one of the reasons earlier I said was wrong thinking and one of those areas of wrong thinking is this, this idea that God controls everything. This idea and notion that God controls everything. That everything is determined by God himself. And if you're not careful, if you don't understand what the Bible calls to as the sovereignty of God, if you don't understand the sovereignty of God in the right context and, and the way the Bible teaches, if you misunderstand that, you will think that you have nothing to do with God. You will think that you don't have a role to play in the things that need to take place in your life. 
You will think that you have no role to play in the things that need to happen in your life and the things that need to happen in the lives of other people as well. But when you understand that you have a role to play in order for God's promises to come to pass in your life, then you begin to walk by faith. You see, because if you take everything for granted and say, well, if, it, if it's God's will, it will happen. If it's not God's will, it will not happen. If that is your stance, then what is the point of faith? What, what is the requirement for us to walk by faith? There is no requirement. Because if it, <clears throat> if it is all up to God, and if he's just going to do, if it is his will, it's going to happen. If it's not his will, it's not going to happen. If that is your way of thinking, again, you can be deceived by that. And what happens when you start thinking that way? The only thing is it weakens your faith. It weakens your stand in God. It weakens your position to fight the good fight of faith. Why? If everything's going to be determined, what's the point of fighting? There's no point. If the match is already fixed... What's the point of me working hard? I'm going to win or I'm going to lose anyway. So there's no point in me doing anything, right? And so it, 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 we need to understand that every single one of us, we're called to fight the good fight of faith, and which means that we have a role to play in, in, in what needs to happen in our lives. And, and, and a lot of times, even when you think about that, see, if you say everything is determined by God and if something needs to happen, God's going to do it. If something shouldn't happen, then God won't do it. Then what's the role of the enemy in our life? I'm like, what does he even do? If, if God is determining every single thing in your life, the enemy doesn't have a job. The devil has nothing to do. And yet the Bible says, John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. That means he has a job. <clears throat> there is a purpose for him. There is certain things that he's trying to do. So, so if you say everything is of God, then even the devil stealing something from you is of God. So don't resist. And the Bible clearly says what? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So even when something gets robbed, you just sit down and say, well, God wanted it to be robbed, so it's robbed. There's no point of resisting. You fall into sin, well, God wanted me to fall in sin, so I sin. You, now, now you, many people won't say that, right? No, 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 God doesn't want me to sin. But, but let it be a sickness, let it be a disease, let it be some kind of some other uh, issue, uh, uh, you know, a, a loss in business or something else. Well, well, maybe God is trying to teach me. Maybe God, it was God's will and God's plan. And we come up with all kinds of religious ideas. And, and if you, if the, the, the reason why I'm saying this is maybe someone needs to hear this. And, and the reason why I'm saying this is because if that is your way of thinking, I'm telling you, it weakens your faith. I'm telling you, you're not going to take the stand of faith that you need to take in order for you to thrive in life. You're not going to fight the good fight of faith the way you need to fight it in order for you to thrive in your life. Amen? Amen. All right. And again, there, there are so many scriptures. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19 says, the, uh, and God says, Today I place before you what? Life and death, blessing and cursing. You choose, though that you and your descendants may live. If everything is chosen, why am I choosing? Are you getting this? So at the end of the day, God has a plan for your life. I'm not saying God doesn't have a plan for your life. But you have a role to play in that plan. You have a role to do certain things in order for that plan to come to pass in your life. Amen? All right. First Timothy chapter 1. And did I say the verse? No? All right. Verses 4 and 5. I'll read from the Amplified. Verses 4 and 5. It says, Nor to give importance to or occupy themselves with legends, which means fables and myths, and endless genealogies, which foster and promote useless speculations and questionings rather than acceptance in faith of God's administration and the divine training that is in faith. Let's jump to verse 5. And it says... Whereas the object and purpose of our instruction and charge is love, which brings from, which springs from a pure heart and a good, clear conscience and sincere, unfeigned faith. Everyone say unfeigned faith. Unfeigned faith. 
Okay, now that's a word that we don't normally use in, in, in our everyday uh, uh, life, right? So what, uh, unfeigned means sincere. It means pure, right? To, to, for something to be feigned means to pretend. Okay, so, so in other words, here Paul is saying there is a chance that you can have pretentious faith. A faith that is not sincere. A faith that pretends because of what they have seen in the lives of other people. All right? So it's not your own. It's not something that you have built up in your life. It is not something that you have revelation of. But just because of you seeing something in someone else, you pretend to have that kind of faith. Right. And see, and, and, and this is where it's important because... There are times in our life when we've, every one of you, you've prayed for certain things that didn't come to pass in your life. You've believed God for certain things and they didn't come to pass in your life. And in those moments, it's, it's easy to say, the first thing that comes to our mind is, God didn't do his part. That's what we say. Well, God, well see, so you pray for someone's healing and they die or something happens and what do you say? God didn't heal them. That's what we say, right? God didn't heal them. Isn't it interesting that the first place we try to blame is God? I've not heard one person say, I prayed and I missed it somewhere. It didn't happen. I, I, I never heard that. I've heard hundreds, if not thousands of times, God didn't do it. It's interesting that we jump right and straight to God. It's like, he didn't do it. I mean, almost to say, I'm perfect. I did everything I'm supposed to do. He didn't do his part. And, and, and we think, see, and, 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 and here's another thing when, when it comes to walking by faith. Have some humility. Have some humility when you walk by faith. Understand that you don't know it all. You know it in the spirit, but not in your brain. Right? You can read the Bible a hundred times, you don't know it all. And the first thing that we jump to a conclusion is, God didn't do his part. Brother, sister, listen to me. God always does his part. You can never, ever, ever accuse God of not doing his part. If you do, you're not worshiping the God that I do. And you don't know the God that I do. Now, it doesn't mean I haven't missed it in my life. There are a lot of times I've missed it in my life. I've had tragedies in my life and in, in, in our family and all of that. But never, ever, ever get to the place where you say, he didn't do his part. When you say that, you are accusing. And it's an assault on the nature and character of God. See, even religious sayings like when you, you never know what God's going to do. You've heard that, right? I mean, it's God's ways, it's mystery. You know, you never know what God's going to do. You never know what God's going to do. Do you realize every time you say that, it's an assault on his nature? See, see for, for example, I have Sam sitting here. If I'm talking about Sam, and I say, you know, uh, uh, Sam said he's going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get the instrument and, and get it fixed. Well, you never know what Sam's going to do. If I say that, is that flattering of him? Is that, am I speaking well of him? No. You know what I'm saying? You know Sam, he's never dependable. You know Sam, he's never, you can never trust his word. That's what you're saying. When you say, you never know what God's going to do, that's what you're saying. No, I know what God's going to do. He's going to do what he said he was going to do in his word. Yes. See, that's walking by faith. See, every time you, 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 you leave it to some kind of mystical thing that like, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, that means you either don't know what the word says or you're not paying attention to what God has already spoken. Are you understanding that? All right, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 11. Uh, sorry, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. So that means, and it, this lets us know that we need to have a pure and sincere faith in order to walk by faith. All right? So Luke chapter 17 and verse 6. 
And it says, and the Lord answered, uh, and the Lord answered, if you had faith, trust, and confidence in God, even so small like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, oh, sorry, to this mulberry tree, be pulled by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Other translation, here in this translation, it says you could say. Other translations say you would say. Right? So Jesus is saying, if you had faith, you would say something. If you had faith, you would say something. Now, we started talking about the importance of words and, and what comes out of our mouth this morning. Now, this is what I'm saying. What are, what, uh, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is coming out of our mouth? All right? What is coming out of our mouth? The words that are coming out of our mouth will determine and let us know whether you have faith or fear and doubt and unbelief in your heart. All right? Fear, faith, doubt, or unbelief in your heart. So here he says, if you would say to this tree, everyone say tree. So Jesus is saying, you can actually speak to a tree. Now the question is, wait, does a tree actually listen? Apparently it does. Because when you read it, the tree obeys what Jesus tells it to do. Right? Now, if, you, if, if a tree can listen to the words that come out of your mouth, guess what? Everything else in your life can listen as well. That means your body can listen. Do you re realize, uh, we're not going to turn there, but when, when Jesus goes to Peter's uh, house, Peter's mother-in-law is sick. Yes. You guys know the story? Yes. So Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and she has a what? A fever, right? Do you realize what happens when, when, when Jesus goes in there? Who does he talk to? Jesus doesn't talk to Peter. Jesus doesn't talk to the mother-in-law. He sees the mother-in-law laying down. He doesn't talk to her. He talks to the fever. He talks to the fever, which means what? And, and, and he commands the fever to leave, and what does the fever do? It leaves, which means what? That means fever can listen to you. If a fever can listen to you, so can cancer. If fever can listen to you, so can a headache. If a headache can listen to you, so can every part of your body. Here's the problem. When your the, the question is, ask yourself, what has my body been hearing? What has my body been hearing about it? See, when, when we get a doctor's report and we say, uh, my, my bad elbow, my bad elbow, my bad elbow, my bad elbow, pastor. I uh, uh, go to the front, uh, you know my bad elbow. So everywhere you go, the only thing that your elbow is listening to is that it is a bad elbow. My bad elbow, my bad elbow, my bad elbow. And Jesus is saying, you will have what you say. And so you are having what you're saying, which is my bad elbow. See, sometimes people will say, the going, before going to the job interview, they'll say, I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to get this. And they go, they finish the interview, and a couple of days later, they find out that they never got it. And so they'll go to their friends, see, I told you, exactly. <laughs> You've been saying it this whole time. And you believe with it, with your heart. And you're saying this the whole time, of course you're not going to get the job. It's not a surprise. See, and so in, in, even in our hearts, e, e, I'm sorry, even in our bodies, even if the doctor told you something, don't start referring to that part of your body according to what the doctor said. Start referring, uh, referencing to that part of the body according to what God has said about it. That's why every morning th that I wake up, even when something's wrong, even when something doesn't feel right, I say, every part of my body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. Every part of my body functions to the perfection. Now, that day I can be having a pain in my foot, a uh, uh, pain in my back, doesn't matter. I declare, I say, every part of my body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. When God created it, he didn't do it with any kind of defect. And if he didn't, then we shouldn't be experiencing that kind of defect in our life as well. Amen?
Now, the question is, can your faith be heard? Can your faith be heard? And if, that, if the answer is yes, is it being heard by the people around you? If faith can be heard, is that, are people around you hearing faith from your mouth? Are they hearing faith from your mouth? Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. It, he says, for assuredly I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things which he says, it will, uh, uh, which he says will be done. He will have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive, and then you will have it. Here again, Jesus is saying, speak about, he tells us to speak to the mountain. He doesn't tell us to speak to God. A lot of us, instead of speaking to the mountain, we speak to God about the mountain. That's what we call prayer. Right? We go and we discuss and we tell God and we explain to Him the problems that we have in our lives. We explain in detail the, the vastness of the, of the mountain. And, and here Jesus is saying, hey, don't talk to God about the mountain. You speak to the mountain because that's the authority that has been given to you. See, a lot of us, now, now doesn't mean you don't pray, but the order is you don't jump to prayer first. You speak to the issue first. So he says, speak to the mountain and command it and tell it what to do. Then he says, then when you pray, believe that you have received. You see, even when you speak, it is speaking plus believing that equals manifestation. It's not just speaking. Some people have taken this to think and, you know, say, okay, if I say this a thousand times, it will happen. If I say this a thousand times, it will happen. No, no, no. You can say it a million times and it will still not happen unless you believe. Are you getting this? So if you believe, speaking plus believing equals manifestation in your life. Speaking plus believing. So he tells us to speak to the mountain, not to God. And then, after speaking to the mountain, then he says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask in prayer, or when you pray, believe that you receive, and then you will have it. Not first waiting for the manifestation. See, and that's why, here, here is the walk of faith that, 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 that is so crucial in our life. You pray about something, and then you walk away and say, uh, it, it still didn't happen, it still didn't happen, it still didn't happen. So what are you saying over and over again that it didn't happen? What are you believing in your heart that it didn't happen? If you are believing in your heart that it didn't happen, and you are saying out of your mouth that it didn't happen, what is going to happen? Nothing happened. Are you getting this? So when you pray, the next step is you have to believe that you've received it. You need to believe that you have the answer for it. So, so for example, if you're praying about the wisdom of God in your life regarding a decision that you need to make, once you pray, you receive the wisdom of God by faith. And then from that point, you say, God, I thank you that I'm being led by your spirit. I thank you that you speak to me. I thank you that you've given me the wisdom. I thank you that I, I hear the voice of the good shepherd, the voice of a stranger I will not follow in my life. I thank you that I will have the wisdom that I need to make the right decision in my life. And what happens? Because before you understand it all, what have you done? You've taken it by faith. Once you take it by faith, now the knowledge and the, the, the expansion of growth that is required begins to slowly take place in your life. See, when, when there is revelation knowledge that comes into your life, don't try to make sense of it all before you receive it. Receive it first, the explanation will come later. If you wait for the explanation first, you're going to be waiting for a long time. You're going to be waiting for a long time. So receive the revelation of God first and then wait for the explanation. And see, if we don't understand this, again, we use prayer for primarily asking God for things. And prayer was primarily a means of communion with God. It wasn't for our prayer requests. 
It's not just about communing with God was, and talking to God was not just about asking everything that we need and want in our life. It was about communing with God. The Bible talks about Jesus prayed all night. What do you think he was asking for? A job? A visa? Court settlement? What was he doing all night? He was communing with the Father. That was, that's what he was doing. So he was communing with the Father, and that's why when he started doing his ministry, he said, I only say what I hear my Father say. I only do what I see my Father do. When was he hearing? When was he seeing? In prayer, when he was communing with the Father. See, for us, a lot of times we go to prayer, and then we start asking, 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 asking. At the end, we slap, in Jesus' name, amen. And then we leave. No time for God to speak to us. No time for instruction. No time for communion. And we expect the wisdom of God to just flow in our life. Are you getting this? All right, let's turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 13. It says, And since we have the same spirit of faith, everyone say spirit of faith, According to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Amen. This is talking, actually it is taken from the book of Psalms where uh, 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 David says this. He says, I believe and therefore I speak. And here Paul is saying, we have the same spirit of faith that David carried. Right. He's saying, we have the same spirit of faith and therefore we believe and therefore we speak. Now, when you are... Uh, uh, what you say is your faith speaking. What you say is your faith speaking all the time and not just when you're in church. All the time and not just when you're at church. Right? What you say is your faith speaking. What comes out of your mouth is your faith speaking. And not just when you're in church, but all the time. So when you're in church with all your friends next to you and all of that, and, and you'll say amen at the right time, and you'll do all the good stuff, all the stuff that you're supposed to do in church, and uh, I say, or a preacher says you are healed, and you say amen, and then you go home. And what do you say after that? So you go home, and the doctor calls, or your friend calls, or your relative calls and asks about the problem. What do you say about that? Because it's still... Your faith is still in operation at those times. You know, here, here is a statement I want you to write down. If you are not satisfied with what you have or where you are, if you are not satisfied with what you have or where you are, quit saying what you are saying. I'll say that again. If you are not satisfied with what you have, or where you are. Quit or stop saying what you are saying. Quit or stop saying what you are saying. You got that? If you're not happy with where you are, stop saying what you've been saying. And say something different. Say something based on the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57 and verse 19. I'll read from the Amplified. It says, Peace, peace to him who is far off, both Jew and Gentile, and to him who is near, says the Lord. I create the fruit of his lips, and I will heal him. This is God speaking, and God is saying that he will create the fruit of your lips. That means what? That means God is waiting to hear what comes out of your mouth. Are you getting that? Now this is from the Old Testament. So, uh, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 tells us, it says, uh, uh, starting from verse 1. It says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Our confession, 
Christ Jesus, the high priest of our confession. That means the high priest of the words that come out of your mouth. Jesus is the high priest of the words that come out of your mouth. Again, the question is, what's coming out of your mouth? We saw this morning from Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2 that the way Jesus fights his battles is by the words that come out of his mouth. The way he created the universe by the, was by the words that come out of his mouth. The way he controlled the, the, the oceans and the winds and everything else in his life was by the words that came out of his mouth. And here he says, now Jesus, who is with the heavenly father in high places, now he is the high priest and the apostle of your confession, of the words that come out of your mouth. So the question is, what's coming out of your mouth? Because what does a high priest do? He, he takes the offering and presents it to God. So now what's happening is Jesus is, has to take your words and present it to God. The high priest of your confession. And God says in, in, in Hebrews, we, uh, I'm sorry, in Isaiah we said, the, the Lord says, I create the fruit of whose lips? Your lips. See, if you say over and over and over and over again things that are opposing the word of God, things that go contrary to the word of God in your life, Jesus has nothing to work with. God has nothing to work with with your life. It's when you begin to say the things that are in line with the word of God, then he has something to work with. Now, again, Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we've read this several times over the last couple of services. Verse 10 finally says, it says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation, which means soteria. That means wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken in your life. That means with the heart you believe, with the mouth confession is made unto healing. With the heart one believes, with the mouth confession is made unto peace in your life. With the heart you believe, with the confession of your mouth comes joy in your life. With the heart you believe, with the confession of your mouth comes prosperity in your life. See, you believe the word of God first and then you begin to speak and declare that and that's what comes to pass in your life. Amen? Now, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 and verses, uh, starting from verse 25. And it says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Now, here's what I want you to see. Verse 28. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be what? Made whole or made well or healed. Right? Now, here's what we need to understand and, uh, and know. If, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, verse 28. If only I might touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. This is some, in other translations or in the Greek, it actually says, she said and she kept saying. The Bible says she said and she kept saying, which means what? That was her confession. And so she says, she said and she kept saying, if I touch his garment, I shall be made well. Now, when did she say that? before she was ever made well. She said that before there was any proof of her being healed. And then what happened in verse, um, let me see, verse uh, 29. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of his body, turned around to the crowd and said, who touched uh, my clothes? But the disciples couldn't find out. And then uh, verse 33, it says, But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing that ha what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Whose faith? I said, whose faith? Your faith. In spite of the circumstances. Again, I want you to understand, we're talking about thriving in our life. 
We're talking about seeing success and reaching the goal and destiny that God has for our lives in spite of the circumstances. Everything in this woman's life and the circumstances that surrounded her said that she would have to live that way for the rest of her life. Everything. Even the law, according to the law, this woman needed to be murdered, stoned and put to death because she was an unclean person coming out in public. Now, not only was she unclean, she was touching a person that was holy. She needed to be put to death by stone. And what happened? Everything around. The Bible says she spent everything that she had in those 12 years. That means her savings, bank accounts, everything gone. Everything gone. There was nothing in her circumstance that told her that she could live any other way. But when she heard about Jesus, the Bible doesn't say this, but I've got to believe that someday, somehow, somewhere she heard about Jesus. Because why? The Bible lets us know that faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So somewhere, some rumors were passing by in her village. Somewhere, some guy came and said, there's a new guy in town. And this guy is just going around miraculously healing people. And he says, you don't even have to be holy to be healed. He says, all you need is faith in him. She heard those things. And when she heard, she said, this is my opportunity. This is my time. This is my moment of redemption. This is my moment of healing. And she took it by faith. And then what did she say? Okay, I don't know how this is going to happen in my life. I don't know how I'm going to get to him. I don't know what rules and regulations are placed. I don't know if the Pharisees are going to be there. I don't know if the Sadducees are going to be there. I don't know if the religious leaders are going to find me. And if they find me, just in case they find me, I know I'm going to be put to death. And yet she said, I don't know all of those things, but this I know based on what I've heard. This is my faith based on what I heard. I only need a moment to touch the hem of his garment. Because if I touch the hem of his garment, I believe I will be made whole. That's what she believed. And she kept saying that and kept saying that. Before she ever saw Jesus, she kept saying that. And the moment when she came... I can imagine her trying to hide her face from everyone, trying to make sure that she would not be found by the religious leaders. That's why even after she got healed, she's not jumping around rejoicing. She's trying to hide and leave. And Jesus said, no, 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 wait, something different happened here. I know there are hundreds of people, thousands of people maybe, who are thronging me, who are falling all over me, and, and many people are touching me. But the way this woman touched, he didn't even know if it was a woman. He said, somebody. All I know, somebody had sincere faith in this place. It wasn't feigned faith. It was unfeigned, sincere faith that just simply, boldly, absolutely, and completely believed in him. It wasn't faint faith. It was sincere faith. This woman was not just praying for the sake of praying. She wasn't attending the meeting because it was Sunday and she needed to attend the meeting. No, no, no. This woman said, I don't care if I die today. I don't care if I'm stoned today. I'm going because I believe. Un Faith, faith. And Jesus says, if you believe, you will say something. The people around her knew what she believed. The question is, do people around you know what you believe? Does your family know what you believe? Do your friends know what you believe? Do your friends know the faith that you have? I'm not talking about whether they know you're Christian or not. I'm not talking about that. I mean, some of you, just by your name, they know you're a Christian. That, I mean, that, that doesn't take great faith. I mean, you're not still living in a country where just by your name they're going to chop your head off. It's not happening. So I'm not talking about, oh, they know my faith, Pastor. Everyone knows in my company I'm a Christian. Give me a break. 
I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when people see you, do they know what you're believing God for? Can they say, man, this guy, in spite of everything that goes on, this guy's faith, he just believes God. In spite of what the doctors say, this guy believes God. In spite of everything that's going on, this guy believes God. In spite of all the tragedy, in spite of all the rejection over and over again, this girl believes God. In spite of what everyone says, this guy believes God. Can people say that about us? Because if we truly have unfeigned faith in our hearts, the people will hear about our faith because we will give voice to the faith that is in our heart. Are you getting this? Let's move on. Let's go to 2 Kings and I'll close with this. 2 Kings chapter 4. And you already know this. <clears throat> Many of you know this story. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to jump through this, but let's start off in verse 15. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 15. And it says, so he called her. So he said, I'm sorry. So he said, call her. When he called her, she stood at the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. And the, grow, uh, and the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to the servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken, when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, and then he died. The, uh, the Bible doesn't let us know exactly what the cause was, but some problem with the head, he dies. And this is what I want you to pay attention to. And she went up, laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of your young men and one of the donkeys, that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. I mean, this woman is not even revealing this to her husband. I want you to think of that. Most of us get a headache. We let all our Facebook friends know about it. Right? I'm feeling sad. My heart is broken. We need to make sure the world knows about it. We show that through our actions, right? And we look for attention. And here, she says, nothing, it is well. Then she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her from afar and he said to the servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now and meet her and say to her, it is well with you. I'm sorry, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? In other words, the prophet says, hey, just make sure I see her coming down, go run and make sure her family is doing well, right? And she answered, it is well. She didn't say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little tired because of the journey. My husband, you know, he's okay, but, but my, my son, there's a problem. She simply says, it is well. Now when she came to the man of God to, at the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said to him, did I ask a son, O my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he, told, then he told to Gehazi, get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. 
If you meet anyone, do not greet him, and if anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother said, <clears throat> mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he rose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, the child has not awakened. When Elisha came to the house, there was the child lying dead on the bed. He went in therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and, uh, and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child and flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself on him. Then the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite woman. So he called her and when she came into him, she said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Here's the question. Not a single time in that entire time. Now, it's easy for us to read that story. This is not an instantaneous miracle that took place. The Bible says the, the prophet comes into the house. He, he's on the child. He prays for the child. And he comes out. Nothing's happening. He's not breathing. Nothing's changed. He goes back and forth. The prophet is going back and forth in the house. Not just the woman. The prophet is. He goes back up again and prays again. There's so much time. We don't know the time. This could have been several minutes. This could have been several hours. We don't know. All I know is it's a lot of opportunity for the woman to say things that go against the promise of God for her life. What was the promise of God? She would have a child. God doesn't give a child so that they can die when they're young. So all she said was, it is well. Why? Because the prophet said that I'm going to have a child and that's what I'm going to believe. Doesn't matter what the circumstances say. And then she believes and believes and believes. When all hope is lost, that's why I love the verse that talks about Abraham. He said, he hoped against hope that means earthly hope was wasn't there everything according to the earthly circumstances was saying you do not have hope for this Abraham and the Bible says he believed in hope what was he doing he set his mind on things that are above and not things that are below Setting your mind on the promises of God rather than the circumstance. It is in those moments, child of God, it is in those moments that faith is proved whether it is true or if it is faint. It is in those challenging moments of your life where, where, where you are either going to crumble by the pressure of the circumstance or you're going to stand firm and fight the good fight of faith and say, in spite of the circumstances, I am going to thrive because I am the righteousness of God. But if, you're not set on, if your mind is not set on things that are above, if, that are, if they're set on things that are below, then you cave in and you quit. You say, well, you know, because of A, B, C, and D. Because of these reasons, <clears throat> we weren't able to do that. Because of these reasons, we had to give up. Because of these reasons, we had to quit. Praying that we would be like this woman. That we would have a pure faith, a sincere faith in our hearts that's not moved by circumstances, but every time there are circumstances, I want our minds to go towards things that are above and say, in spite of this, God's hand's going to be proved in my life. In spite of this, I will stand strong. In spite of this, I will thrive. And because that's the life that God has called us to live. 
And I want us to be people who give voice to our faith every single day, every single moment, no matter what the situation, give voice to faith. Don't give voice to circumstance. Don't give voice to reason. Don't give voice. Again, I'll say this again. Do not let reason rob you from faith. I'll tell you, if you're trying to make sense of everything you read in the Bible, you will not. You will not. And you can try to reason stuff away and it will rob you from the life and destiny that God has for you. Like I said, you, every miracle in the Bible does not make sense. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Almost every instruction that Jesus ever gave does not make sense. Doesn't make sense. Oh, you need wine? You need wine for the wedding? Get some water. Jesus, you, do, don't we need grapes for that? No, 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 get water. Doesn't make sense. We need taxes. We need money to pay taxes. Go fishing. Peter, go fishing. Get the first fish. You're going to get the money. Doesn't make sense. Oh, we need to feed thousands of people, Jesus. We need to send them away. They need to go and get their food. Does anyone have food here? Yep, but Jesus, I mean like two loaves? I mean uh, five loaves and two fish? Thousands of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just get that to me. I'll handle it. Does not make sense. Nothing does. Nothing does when you get to the instructions of God. Nothing does. And it's in those moments where you decide, I'm going to walk by faith or I'm going to walk by sight. And here's the thing. You can be a Christian and walk by sight for the rest of your life and you'll still be a Christian. I mean, you can, you can still do that. God doesn't say it's, it's either faith or hell. No, 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 he doesn't say that. He says, you can be a Christian and still decide to walk by sight. But I believe we miss out on the supernatural life that God has called us to live. And I think every single one of us need to experience that in our life and need to live based on the supernatural that God has for us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. <clears throat> Father, I pray that every single one of us will have a sincere faith in our life. That we will walk by sincere faith and not by sight. That your promises will prevail. That in spite of the circumstances, Lord, I declare over your people this evening that every one of them will thrive in their life in spite of the circumstances because they place their faith in you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you administer to your people. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word will take deep root in their lives. And their lives will never be the same. And that we will bring forth a mighty harvest. In Jesus' name I pray.